Hawaii actually was the first place that actually started a suit regarding marriage rights for same-sex couples in the nation. It was 1993 when the Hawaii Supreme Court came down with the decision that same-sex couples had the right to marriage and all the rights that go along with it. I'm a filmmaker who's passionate about LGBTQ plus issues. But like so many of us, I never grew up learning about our collective queer history. So, with the help of a few friends, we're traveling the world to different Pride celebrations to learn more about where we came from and where we are going. Honolulu, Hawaii. Located on the island of Oahu, the city is a melting pot of Asian, Pacific, and Western cultures. In Hawaiian, Honolulu means sheltered harbor. The city's desirability as a port contributed to its growth and significance in the Hawaiian archipelago. In 1850, King Kamehameha III shifted the capital of the Hawaiian kingdom to Honolulu. Here, you'll find the Eolani Palace, the only royal palace on American soil. On August 21st, 1959, Hawaii became the 50th U.S. state, with Honolulu serving as its state capital. Famous for its spectacular beaches and warm tropical climate, Hawaii is a global travel destination, with tourism making 21% of the state's economy. Hawaii is also considered the birthplace of modern-day surfing. In fact, Honolulu is home to one of the most famous beaches in the world, Waikiki Beach which happens to be the epicenter of the city's gay culture, nightlife, and tourism. And it is also here where many LGBTQ plus rights were fought. It was in Honolulu on December 17, 1990, that gay rights activist William E. Woods gathered three same-sex couples at the main office of the Hawaii Department of Health with the purpose of obtaining marriage licenses. On April 12, 1991, the couple's application was denied after the Hawaii Attorney General's office concluded that under the United States Constitution, the right to marry was fundamental only for different sex couples. With the encouragement of William E. Woods, the couples initiated their lawsuit with the aim of declaring the exclusion of same-sex marriages unconstitutional. In 1993, the surprise outcome of the Bear vs. Mike case with the Hawaii Supreme Court decision supporting same-sex marriage, started a chain of events leading to the legalization of same-sex marriage in the United States. But long before Woods and other 20th century activists were fighting for LGBTQ rights in Hawaii, the islands had very different ideas about sexuality and gender. I'm meeting with Hinale Moana Wongkalu to learn more about pre-colonial Hawaiian identities. One of my most uh, recent projects has been the film called Kapai Mahu, which became a museum exhibit and it also became an all-age reader book. The story of the healer stones of Kapai Mahu speaks to us about four legendary healers whom came to Hawaii centuries ago. And they came from our ancestral homelands in Tahiti. And these four healers brought with them the knowledge of medicine, medicinal arts, and healing. And they were so helpful and, and so instrumental to the people of that time that these commemorative stones, the four stones, uh, brought miles away to the shores of Waikiki to honor them. Um, it is a tribute to these four healers. And the notable thing about these four healers is that they were extra powerful. They were, they were able to minister in ways that garnered the attention of the Hawaiians of that time. And in part, it was because their spiritual self was both male and female. They were mahu. Um, that is the understanding of the story that we are telling in Kapai Mahu. Mahu is a space between male and female on an emotional, spiritual, psychological, and oftentimes the, the physical level as well. Mahu, to me, means 
Number one, it's a blessing because I am blessed to possess elements of both kane and wahine or male and female, meaning that in how I see the world, how I feel, my, my thoughts, my feelings, my emotions. The Western equivalent to mahu would be, it would fall within the spectrum of LGBTQI. Most often the trans, transgender uh, category, but not limited to that. It is inclusive of also gay, lesbian. It's, it's a very inclusive term that catches that spectrum of LGBTQI. In Hawaii, post-foreigner impact and collision with our people, we have the introduction of Christianity by 1820. Less than a year before this, traditional religion is abolished. And so, what happens is there's an introduction and an infiltration of foreign ideology, including Christian values, which didn't have to be the villain, but uh, the Christians that arrived in Hawaii were quite oppressive and they suppressed and their, their dictates suppressed many things, many elements in Hawaiian culture. And part and parcel of this was a rightful place of mahu in and amongst society right next to Kane and Wahine. Mahu are now required to behave in manners or in a manner that is different. Uh, mahu are not necessarily in certain circles immediately accepted or immediately respected. And that also includes having a job, being able to find a house you know, or adequate housing. Um, oftentimes, the disenfranchisement of our mahu comes because attitudes and perspectives have changed the people. So people around us, even my own people, my fellow Hawaiians, often now um, will take a very foreigner type of approach to someone like myself. And that attitude and that kind of mental construct about who and what we're all about um, is highly skewed. Celebrating anything that has to do with Mahu or even the larger, more Western approach to LGBTQI, it's fine and dandy, but it's just a reminder to me that I'm living in a society that doesn't always have room and doesn't always maintain a place and space for us to exist in respect and dignity. As a Kanaka, as a Native Hawaiian, any opportunity that I have to be it and all about it for some aspect, some element of Hawaiian culture, or to reflect my language, to utilize, to speak my language, and to advocate for it, to promote it, and to be staunch about it. Um, it is up to me to do so and to hopefully inspire others to do so as well. By the 1960s, sentiments towards the LGBTQ plus community in Hawaii began to shift. I'm meeting with DeSoto Brown, historian and archivist at the Bishop Museum, to learn more about the illustrious Glade Show Club, which was a place of refuge and sanctuary for Mahu during a time when society shunned them. In the 1960s here in Honolulu, there was a particular nightclub called the Glade. And in local talk, we all referred to it as the Glades, but it was actually just called the Glade. And it featured what was called a boys will be girls review or a female impersonator show. And this was different from the way drag queens work today in that it was not where the performers stood up and lip synced to popular music and they were not quite as theatrical. They wanted to be seen more as showgirls, as regular performers. So the Glade nightclub was very popular with a whole bunch of different audiences. It did not just attract a gay audience, let's say, but a whole bunch of people throughout the community. What's the story behind the I'm a boy button? In 1963, a law was passed in the state of Hawaii that prohibited cross-dressing. In other words, dressing in the clothing of the opposite sex purportedly with the intent to deceive. And this all got started because there was this community belief that mahu or essentially men dressed as women were taking advantage of young men and getting them to get gifts and give them things and pay for things, pretending that they were females. 
Well, I don't think anybody was really deceived, but regardless of that, the law was passed that made it illegal to do that. A judge at one point in the early stages of this law said in a, in a court case, advised that if someone, if a male was dressed as a female, you would be circumventing the law if you just wore some kind of sign that said, I am a boy or I am a man. And then you weren't trying to deceive anybody. Well, the Glade nightclub actually produced pin-on buttons that said, I am a boy, and then Glade nightclub and their name and address, etc., on the button. Well, these buttons were collected by people who went to the Glade and saw the show. But for the performers in the Glade, when they were not on stage and they were actually intermingling with the customers, they had to wear the button. And in theory, when they were out in the streets, they had to wear the button to avoid arrest for breaking the law that said it was illegal to dress in the clothes of the opposite sex. Can you describe what it was like for Mahu who were made to wear these buttons? I think that having to wear a button that said what your biological sex was, was demeaning and it was singling people out for treatment that they didn't deserve. And it was a way of saying, I think essentially, we're the government, we won't let you get away with this because there's social disapproval of it. So for the Mahu then, I think it was humiliating. And I think it also exposed them to potentially being uh, the victims of violence. So it was not something that was really needed. And it was just a way of, I would say, almost oppressing people. And even before the Glade nightclub existed, even before the law existed, it was already known that there were men dressed as women in certain parts of downtown Honolulu. And that was just a place where you went because you wanted to be with your other people who were like you. So whenever you're gathered in groups like that, if you are something that people don't like, then the bad people can come and pick you out. The bad people can say, we'll go down there and we'll harass them or we'll beat them up or we'll abuse them. So in one sense, if you were out there at all as being gay or being trans, you're already in a situation where you're very vulnerable. I think having to wear a button that says I'm a boy just sets you off that much more to make you potentially even more of a target of the people who wanted to do harm to you. For the transgender community, it was very important because it was a place where Mahu could not only gather and socialize and be among themselves, but it was also safe, even though the streets outside were not, but inside you were safe, you could be who you were. And it was also a way to earn a paycheck, meaning that you were not necessarily just outside of society, you didn't necessarily have to become a sex worker, but you could be earning a regular paycheck and you could be getting praised for what you did. You could be doing a good job. You could be putting on a show that people wanted to come and see, and you could be paid for it. So at a time of a lot of community opposition, the Glade was really important. The Mahu continue to face community opposition in daily life. Change is happening, and attempts to educate the public on Mahu identity and healing culture is becoming more common. The Healer Stones of Kape Mahu was an exhibition held at Bishop Museum in 2022. It was co-curated by Hinale Moana, Wong Kalu, Dean Hammer, and Joe Wilson. Well, the exhibition at Bishop Museum really covered a lot of different things. And so while the Mahu aspect of it and the sexuality and the sexual expression part is very important, there are other aspects to the story as well, because the historic stones are located in a place where a huge city has grown up around them. They were once in a rural, fairly rural area, not developed very much. And so today, millions of people go through this area where the stones are. So they get a lot more attention than they would have had they been located in out in the country somewhere. So the story of how Waikiki grew into a huge urban city around the stones, where the stones were located for hundreds of years, is part of the story. Healing is part of the story as well, because the healers who the stones commemorate, while they were Mahu, were also healers. So they brought traditional knowledge. And we talk about what were the traditional ways of healing. 
that Hawaiians saw that are different perhaps from Western medicine. So there are many aspects to the story and the exhibition, in the exhibition, we tried to cover as many of those individual stories as we could. With the help of local healers and historians like Hinale Moana Wongkalu and DeSoto Brown, public support for the LGBTQ community and Mahu people has grown. For the first time, Mahu led the Honolulu Pride Parade. The group paused to chant a special prayer for long life, taking a moment to acknowledge the healer stones. On October 2022, the city and county of Honolulu reached an agreement to add additional signage at the Stones of Life site on Waikiki, providing visitors with access to long hidden history of Kaipemahu and its connection to gender fluidity. I'm meeting with Akea Kayakina, an artist, scholar, and theater practitioner, and their partner, Kaimi Awuuo Clay Camberg, an artist, PhD student in indigenous politics, and art printer, to discuss diaspora pertaining the native people of Hawaii, also known as the Kanaka Maoli. We persist today, Kanaka Maoli, doing things that are, run contrary to the norms. Uh, settler colonial norms. My culture, and traditionally our culture, didn't see us as being queer to anything. In fact, we had station, we had uh, responsibility. We were still very integral to, um, you know, the way our family runs. It's important to recognize that um, there is research going on um, and activism that's going on that differentiates between uh, indigeneity um, within these spheres and with the idea of LGBTQ. So Dr. Felicia Brown Acton from Niue, who is based in Aotearoa, um, with the help of um, brothers and sisters of Oceania, have come up with what we call it, not an acronym, but it's the a mnemonic. Mnemonic. MVP FAF Plus. Felicia Brown Acton um, you know, argues that it's a more appropriate mnemonic to describe Pacifica relations. We already had terms to describe these these relations. We already had um, stories, uh, histories associated with these relations, and they're powerful. While the West was still trying to figure out um, and still trying to develop their discourse on sexuality the Pacific, in the Pacific, that discourse, oh, if you would call it one, um, that genealogy of thought had been thriving for a thousand plus years. Um, so because they de developed separately, um, it is important to recognize the distinction. Additionally, can you share with us the meaning of aloha aina? Aloha aina is a very politicized term now. Um, and I would argue that it's been political since the late 1800s um, around the, the overthrow of the Hawaiian kingdom. Um, this word started to really pop up in our Hawaiian language newspapers. Um, it started to fill the mouths of our people. You know, when we think about Hawaiian language, Hawaiian words, uh, a Hawaiian word or phrase carries multiple meanings which are all relevant at the time of the utterance. So aloha aina um, is an actual, it's very, very much an ancient way of receiving the land, but also working with the land, being in the presence of the land, ancestors, the gods. Um, it is a feeling before it is a word. Hawaiians are not passive, and that's a myth, but when we express love, love isn't something that is directed exactly toward the person you're speaking about. It goes through land. So as we say ho'ailona or symbols, right? Uh, symbols of nature, symbols of uh, degeneration and regeneration, destruction and reconstruction, um, the, that observation of land and all of those systems moving together is where aloha is expressed through. Would you be able to elaborate on the influence of political tensions of a Hawaii under American occupation? There's a lot and um, we're going to keep it brief. Um, a lot of conversations that um, if you want to dive into detail, we got our podcast coming out, Kuka Kiki, which talks about all these tensions. But to list some, um, right now we're dealing with the poisoning of our water sources um, by the U.S. military. And the attitude of, eh, it's okay. We want to make sure Hawaii is safe um, in terms of military power and presence. Rather than drinking water, eh. So more to that. Um, we're dealing with conversations of 
who wants to be American? There are conversations of, I'm happy being a part of this colonial empire. Others are saying, no, I want the right to self-govern and I don't want to be um, limited to what America has. And these are conversations about being federally recognized versus being sovereign. If we say yes to federal recognition, that means that America is like, okay, got you. You are now a part of me and there's nothing you can do about it. Where, when we talk about show me the treaty, we don't have a treaty with America that is legally binding that says, hey, of course, yes, let us, let us be a part of it. So the tensions are still there. The tensions frame and influence all of our choices in terms of being queered indigenous people. Um, LGBTQIA as an American pride, woohoo, yes. But sometimes we fit in there, sometimes we don't. So we see that even in, in pride where it's a celebration, sure, but we don't always have a, have a space to feel appreciated and to feel pride. Because when we have the kind of white homo-nationalists being like, white men being like, yes, let's go and, and rage and have these like amazing pool parties, sure. But no conversations about what land are you on? Are you having that pool party? What kind of um, benefits? How are you benefiting from the dispossession of natives? Those are the tensions that we're bringing to the forefront with the podcast, with the theater work, with the research that are happening. Um, and in hoping in the next five years, there's going to be a huge plethora of conversations to check out and, and learn from. What to Westerners might seem like a fantasy vacation getaway is in fact an island of deep cultural significance. Queerness and culture are interconnected. In Hawaii, Mahu and other indigenous understandings of gender and sexuality have existed since time immemorial. If we look to the traditional stewards of these lands, we have much to learn about care, fluidity, and expansiveness. The Kanaka Mali show us that in order to thrive, we have to embrace and stand in solidarity with each other and the land. The late Queen Lily Kalali says, Aloha is to learn what is not said, to see what cannot be seen, and to know the unknowable. Maybe it is through curiosity and humility that we can envision better futures for queer people.